Today, the word gothic conjures up images of horror, of vampires and grotesques, evil spectres and vulnerable heroines. Gothic novels inspired cinema, creating a popular culture of nightmares. When monsters lurk in the shadows, ready to wreak destruction. But there's an altogether earlier Gothic world, a sacred world of great cathedrals and churches, built in the architectural style we call medieval Gothic. Gothic architecture arrived in England 800 years ago. It was a style of building that took risks, ever taller, brilliant engineering in stone, that used pointed arches rather than round ones. Intricate tracery and huge stained glass windows. A new and agile architecture of dazzling light. But the Gothic sensibility shaped more than buildings. It was a world picture that shaped man's understanding of God in the heavens above, humanity below, and the day of reckoning never far away. It was a way of making sense of the world, embracing both the spiritual and the secular. It seems to represent stability, continuity, and yet the Gothic period was one of the most turbulent in English history. A time of civil war, the assassination of kings, and the Black Death. Plague would wipe out a third of the population of Christendom and decimate England. And yet, the Gothic Revolution would reach new heights, especially here in Britain. It would become a national style, eclipsing the rest of Europe and create a new sense of English nationhood and patriotism. Gothic art and architecture would transform medieval England from a European backwater into a world leader of style and power. century England was a dangerous and oppressive place. After his victory at the Battle of Hastings in 1066, William the Conqueror and his Norman barons built castles to subjugate the Anglo-Saxon population of England. Formidable and overbearing, this was an architecture of conquest. Known as Romanesque, because its swagger harked back to the days of the Roman Empire, walls were thick, arches were round, and windows almost an afterthought. And the churches and the cathedrals they built were just as oppressive. This truly was an architecture you couldn't argue with. When you come inside a Norman cathedral, there are the same Romanesque characteristics. The small windows, the rounded arches, and the massive columns made of pre-cut stones or cylinders placed one on top of the other and then filled with rubble. They go up very quickly. And through their sheer bulk, they act as an expression of Norman supremacy. 
But with the Norman invasion came a wave of new clerics. They would take over the church in England. None was more powerful than Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury. Born in Lombardy, he rose to power in England, in spite of frequent quarrels with the Norman kings. He was a theologian and philosopher who dared to question religious orthodoxy. The early medieval world had seen mankind trapped in a head-to-head -head battle between God and the devil. Now Anselm wanted to focus on Christ and his humanity. He even dared address questions of man's free will and how reason could be a meaningful part of faith. When he tries to understand why God took human form as Jesus, Anselm concludes that this was God's ultimate act of love, a gift to humanity, because he let his only son suffer torture and death so that we could be saved. Anselm thinks that this should be the true focus of Christian prayer and meditation. I've come to the British Museum in London to look at two extraordinary ivory carvings. The difference between the two objects shows what an effect Anselm's thinking would have. This is an important little object. It's an ivory carving dated to around 450 AD, and it shows a very early depiction of Christ on the cross. But what do we see? Well, Christ's legs are quite rigid. He seems to be standing on a platform, and his arms are straight out on the cross. He looks out at the viewer, and he's shown very youthful. He's not bearded here at all. What about the people around him? Well, you've got Mary and John here. They're not showing any sorrow. They're being quite stoic. So why is Christ shown on the cross in this way? Well, it's to show his divinity. Here, Christ isn't suffering. He's moving through death in order to achieve eternal life. He's triumphant. But Anselm pursued a faith that focused on the humanity of Christ, a shift in emphasis and understanding that would transform how art depicted Christ and how worshippers empathised with him. Another ivory of the same scene shows a very different picture. It's 14th century, probably carved in France, so well and truly in the Gothic period. And you can tell that from the architectural details that, that frame it. But something very different is going on with the crucifixion here. Christ is literally hanging from the cross. You can see his hands are pointing upwards, emphasising that they're having to support his whole weight on just one nail. His head lolls over to one side. He doesn't make direct eye contact with the viewer anymore. And his legs bend over to one side too. He's very thin, almost skeletal. You can see the bones here in his elbows and even individual ribs in his rib cage. And this suffering is echoed by the figures around him. You can see the mourners, Mary and John. Mary's almost fainting with grief. So the viewer looking at this is being asked to empathise with this human suffering. Paris one of the great sites of medieval pilgrimage. The faithful flocked here to honour an early martyr to the Christian cause, Saint-Denis, a third-century bishop of Paris, beheaded for his faith. But the old church housing his shrine could not cope with the crowds of pilgrims. It was decided it must be rebuilt and in a manner befitting France's premier saint. Gothic architecture was born.
the head of the Abbey of Saint-Denis at the start of the 12th century was a man called Abbot Suger. Now, he was no meek and modest monk. He was a friend and advisor to two French kings. He was a statesman, a patron of the arts and a poet. Work began in 1140 to build a new choir attached to the old Abbey church. Out went dismal and dark masonry. In came windows with glorious stained glass. Daring new pointed arches and ribbed roof vaults distributed the weight of stone much more skillfully than before, allowing wider spans, thinner, taller columns and bigger windows. It was a new sense of light and space that would define not just a new style of architecture, but of faith too. Suger had his own poetry inscribed around the church, and for the consecration of the new choir, he wrote, the church shines with its middle part brightened, and bright is the noble edifice with this new light. The new style would spread quickly, and shocking events across the Channel meant that Gothic would take a hold in England. Canterbury Cathedral in Kent. Peaceful today, but eight and a half centuries ago, the scene of the most infamous murder in British history. In 1170, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Becket, was hacked to death in his own cathedral, murdered by a band of knights reputedly acting on the orders of the king. The Pope was quick to respond, and Becket was made a saint, transforming Canterbury into the most fashionable destination for pilgrims throughout Europe. So when fire destroyed the east end of the cathedral in 1174, it was clear something extraordinary had to replace it. A chapel fit for a murdered saint. Stained glass windows celebrating the life of Becket and his miraculous powers even after death are just one splendor of the massive rebuilding operation. One of the monks of Canterbury, Gervais, wrote an account of the work which took nine years to complete. Gervais makes a really interesting comparison between the old Romanesque features and the new Gothic ones. So he talks about the piers there in the choir. He says that their length was increased about 12 feet. So he's stressing the new height of Gothic buildings. And then he describes some of the surface detail. He says the arches and everything else had been made flat as though done with an axe, but here, in the new building, there is suitable chisel work on almost all things. So again, he's drawing attention to things like the chevrons, the decorated designs on the capitals. And the final point, he says, the walls between the transept and the choir are gone. Now they seem to meet in one keystone in the middle of the great vault. So gone is the array of columns that would obstruct the view of the choir in the old Romanesque church. And instead we have this wonderful open space. He concludes that all this, if one wishes to understand it, will be revealed more clearly by the sight of the church than by these words. Gothic had arrived. Canterbury Cathedral could now claim both spiritual and architectural preeminence in the religious life of the nation. The language of Gothic, with its ever more daring pointed arches,